Um, but yeah, so this is Emily and she's going to be doing a session on technical coaching. So take it away. Oh, well, wow, thank you. Yeah, I'm really, really happy to be here. I haven't met any of you in person, but this is the this is life today, all online. I'm based in Sweden and um, but I grew up in the UK near Oxford. So I but I've been in Sweden for more than 20 years. So um, it's it's kind of cool to to be here. Oh, hello, Joe. <laughs> it's nice if you put your cameras on, actually, because it, it you know it makes it easier for me to see who I'm talking to. So do feel free to put your cameras on. Great. Um, lots of people. Yes. So this is uh, oh someone asking where in Sweden. I live in Gothenburg, which is on the west coast. It's very beautiful, especially in the summer. Don't come in the winter, come in the sun. Um, yes, so today we've got this topic of technical coaching, which is um, something that I do a lot of uh, talking about and, and doing. And I'm, I was thinking to try and make this session a bit interactive uh, so that you get to talk to one another and discuss the, the things that I'm, the issues I'm raising. So that we've got this Myra board. Um, so I'm just gonna share my screen to see what you should perhaps, I, I'm kind of, expecting you to have seen this kind of online whiteboard board before um, but the specifics of Miro or Miro might be new to you so uh, I think you can see the Miro board on my screen yeah yep. great and this is the welcome page just that's the the text you already had I think um, so I use uh, I've got this first frame here that I've just revealed, and um, I've put some ideas here about what might be your top issues in your development organization, um, and some extra notes for anything that you think I've obviously missed. So in a minute, I'm gonna ask you to go out into breakout rooms uh, in groups of between two and four, probably and um, talk about what are the top issues in your organisation. And if there are any of these ones that I've listed, you could grab one of these little emojis and put it next to it. Um, and, you know, so I'm, I'm hoping that they each note will gather a little crowd of, of uh, pretty markers. Um, so we get an impression of what your top issues are, basically. And do add your own ideas and add, of course, you can vote for, for your own ideas as well. All right, and I probably need to uh, lock some things so that they don't move around so much. So hopefully that that frame won't move now. So um, hopefully the instructions are clear. I'm going to give you a timer on the Myra board for how long you've got to discuss. Um, I think it's going to be about six minutes. Um, and Amanda, can you help me with those breakout rooms? Yeah, I'm on it at the minute. Just bear with. Yeah. Is just running a little bit slow. Welcome back. Yes, most people seem to be back in the room now. So welcome back. So that was just a, a very short discussion and you've come up with loads of, of really interesting and important issues. Um, so I'm just sharing my screen so you can um, see what I see. And it's there's a so the, the the light yellow notes are the ones that I came up with in the first place and the dark uh, yellow ones are the ones that you've come up with now. Um, and so the reason I put those uh, notes on in advance were these these were the kind of issues that I think that the technical coaching might help with. And of course, some of the things that you've raised that I didn't think of, some of those might also be helped by having technical coaching. So um, I, I'm not going to tell you <laughs> which ones I think at the moment. You can probably hopefully work that out by the end of the presentation. That will be a measure of my success. Um, but there seem to be a lot of votes around this with um, some developers being indispensable. No one else knowing their important stuff that they know. Um, there's a lot of votes here for technical debt and something lots of votes here for siloed teams. So these seem to be some of the top issues that you're facing in your organisation. So I want to tell you a little bit about um, technical coaching and what that is, and uh, hopefully we'll be able to put that in a context because, you know, I work in this kind of context all the time where you've got um, 
some really skilled developers who are indispensable and technical debts and and actually yeah siloed teams this is the kind of situation that i'm i'm familiar with so let me talk to you about technical coaching so we just did that now technical debt is one of the terms on on one of those notes and that's um something that i work with a lot it's and this definition by martin fowler i find quite helpful to describe it because he says technical debt is deficiencies in the internal quality of the code that make it harder than it would ideally be to modify and extend so it's a it's slowing you down it's a kind of a constant drag when you're trying to modify and extend the code and it's it's internal to the code itself you can't see it unless you go and look into the code actually so it's somewhat invisible if you don't read the code you can only see it by its effects, the, the slowdown. So if it gets really bad, we can even talk about legacy code that has got a lot of technical debt. Um, usually it's very large and complicated. It doesn't have very good automated tests. It might not have any at all, but it's really valuable. It works. And I've got this picture of this chest of drawers because I, I think it's a good analogy. You, you've all got one. It's really important. But if you're honest, you're not sure what's in it and it's a bit messy, you know, so that's that's kind of my my picture for legacy code. So then I often put this question to groups of developers um, about what makes coding fun. And I put I give them a list of these options and, and the little blue dots. Those are the votes that come back. So I didn't choose to do this interactively with you, but sometimes I do that with groups of but where it's mostly developers and consistently um, they all vote for it's it, it's good to build something important to users that that motivates them that makes coding fun and it also is is fun when the code is clear and easy to understand and when you've got a clear task or goal in mind and then the other things that you might think that programmers are really interested in like using go which is like a cool new programming language um, or or particular tool like VS Code, um, you know, the exact programming language and the tools don't seem to matter as much. So for, for a lot of programmers, they're very intrinsically motivated to do a good job, actually. And uh, in most organisations, there's a lot of people around the programmers helping them to build the right thing and to make sure they've got a clear task or goal. But there's very little attention paid to making sure that the code is clear and easy to understand, i.e. doesn't have too much technical debt. So, so that's kind of where I, I think technical coaching comes in a bit, really. Because technical debt can be a really big problem. And this is um, a study that was done in 2019 by some actual scientists who uh, went to various organisations and asked the developers uh, can you tell me how much of your time you're wasting due to technical debt? And of course, they did it scientifically and explained what that was and what wasting means. And, you know, and they got a variety of, of responses. Um, some poor developers are spending more than 90 percent of their time just kind of handling technical debt. So not removing it, just kind of being slowed down by it. But that's kind of uh, unusual. It's more more commonly under 50 percent that the mean average was 23 percent. But there's a lot of developers actually who don't see this as a problem at all, really, you know, under 10 percent. I don't think you can do any better than that, actually. So in some organisations, technical debt is really affecting the productivity of the developers. And if you could increase your productivity by the you know, 10 percent by removing technical debt, for a lot of organizations that would really be worth it so this is um a an example of some technical debt it's an exercise called the gilded rose that i have on my github page and it's a very popular exercise you probably can't read this code it's it's very small on the slide but you can kind of see the shape of it that it kind of it's it's deeply indented um, it's very long. If you could read the words, I'd tell you that they they don't really describe what's going on. It's kind of the names aren't very good. And this code is is difficult to understand. It is difficult to modify and extend. 
So this has technical debt. And most developers faced with this, they're like, no, I can't do anything. And then you teach them some techniques for refactoring and you show them a little demo of, of how to, to work on this. And they're like, oh yeah, okay. And then this is, it's an exercise, you know, they go away and they apply the techniques, improve the design of the code. And then at the end, they're like, actually, I can understand this now and I can, I can extend this and add features and it's okay. So it's taking those developers through that experience that you can do something about technical debt. And that's something I do as part of my coaching quite often. So this is what we want, really. We want to try and keep the technical debt under control. Um, if it's slowing us down too much, we, we make some um, investments in, in removing it so that we can get to a, a, a smaller level of technical debt. I don't think you can get it to zero, but you can get it to a level where it's not slowing you down too much. And that's the kind of intervention that technical coaching could help you with. So I want to go back to this thing about intrinsic motivation by developers. So um, I think if you're going to deal with technical debt, you need some skills. You need to teach some skills for actually removing it. But you also need to kind of create this culture and, and motivation that developers will do the right thing. Um, so this picture is of a, a craftsman. It's a very old picture and he's signing this violin that he's just made. He's very proud of it. So this this kind of sense of, of pride, I think, is why developers are kind of attracted to this craftsman metaphor. It's that feeling of building something you're proud of. Um, having said that, I don't really like the craftsmanship metaphor because I'm an engineer. You know, I'm what I do is based on maths and science. Um, I'm not really one of these old fashioned craftsmen. Uh, I particularly dislike this archaic word. Um, but I think the, the feeling of pride is something that we can tap into with developers that that um, if we can make it that they've got this. They feel they've got the skills to do it and that it's encouraged and they can be proud to remove technical debt and improve the code. That's what we're trying to get at. So when I say skills for managing technical debt, um, these are some of the specific skills that I mean. We're talking about refactoring, as I explained, that's uh, the, the exercise I showed you. The Gilded Rose is an exercise in refactoring. Um, I've also got test driven development there, which is more a technique for new code, actually, when you're building new features uh, than it is for removing technical debt. But still, it's, there's a lot of really important skill in that. And if you can learn TDD, it's a really good uh, way into being able to handle legacy code. Then we've got object oriented design and approval testing. Uh, OO design you've probably heard of. Approval testing you may not have, but it's a, a style of testing that I find very useful with legacy code um, that I'm probably not going to say much more about today. But it's one of the things I teach in the in the coaching. So I think there's a whole bunch of skills that a lot of developers honestly don't really have um, and have not been taught at university and so they need to kind of learn them on the job really. And test driven development, I, I wanted to highlight this one because um, it's been around for like 20 years since Kent Beck published his first book on test driven development and it has, you know, there's there's some real enthusiasts like myself who've been saying yes this is how you should do it but it really hasn't caught on very widely as a way of working. So, but I was encouraged by this research. Um, I don't, has anyone seen this book? You could raise your hand if you've, uh, if you've read this book or if you've seen it. Yes. Oh yes, that's quite a few people have seen this book. Yeah, so I'm very encouraged by that. You can lower your hands again. This is a, a came out in 2018. And it's um, it's ongoing research that's still ongoing, actually, and very well respected researchers. And they basically do this annual survey asking all the companies in their uh, in the survey, what, what are you doing to deliver software? And they get a lot of responses from companies that are doing really well that they call elite. 
Um, and they so they have some idea about what these companies are doing to be so successful. And I think it's very interesting to, to read that. I mean, not that um, you can just copy that directly, what they're doing, but that if you if it's statistically a lot of the really, really effective companies are doing those things, that's kind of a, a good sign. Oh, I only got lost there. And one of the things that they find is that these elite companies, at least, are doing test driven development. They're doing a bunch of other stuff as well. It's not the only reason that they're successful, but it's one of the things that they're doing. And that just totally fits, fits my biases. So that's the element of the research I choose to uh, highlight. But I do recommend you go and read it yourself. Um, so I'm interested about your organisation and what training you're giving your developers in these kinds of skills, like refactoring and test driven development and handling technical debt. So let me open up the next uh, discussion. So I've again, I've put some notes for some of the things that I think you might be doing to help your developers learn these things. And you could write some notes as well. So uh, and vote, vote for the things you're doing and write some more things. Is that instructions clear? Great. Amanda, please help me with the breakout rooms again. Yeah, we should be a lot quicker this time. <laughs> Great. Great. So I think most people are back now from the breakout rooms. So this is really interesting um, feedback that you're giving me here. Uh, we've had quite a few votes for pair programming and code reviews, and at least some of you have 20% time for your own projects and coding dojos. And these notes that you've written are very interesting as well. I mean, shadowing on the job and, job and coaching and mentoring, I. I kind of, I guess I took those as read that you'd have that, but I'm glad to see it explicitly. Um, and then there's just a note here that so you expect people to already know this when you bring them in. I just wanted to comment that, that if that's true, then that's amazing because people who know TDD and refactoring are difficult to recruit. There aren't very many of them. Um, anyway, so I'm just, I'll leave it at that. But this is what the most of you are saying here is that the the big uh, tickets are pair programming and code reviews and, and this kind of mentoring that happens on the job. So that that's not untypical. So I just wanted to uh, say a little bit about how I've found my experience with test driven development. I, I read this book by Kent Beck back in 2000 and my team at the time we were very enthusiastic about it and we all started writing unit tests and pair programming and helping one another and we were just this was a fantastic experience everyone was like yeah yeah this is great we should always work this way and then i joined this new team in 2002 when nobody from the old team came with me and none of them were doing this stuff and i was like but this is so much better we should do this and i couldn't yeah so my first attempt to persuade them was browbeating. It was just like, you have to write unit tests, it's better. Look at my unit tests, they're great, you should do this. Or I found this code you wrote, I refactored it for you, and I found a bug in it. This did not really make me very popular. And it didn't work, it didn't work at all. Shouting at people turns out to be a very bad way to persuade them to try new things. Um, so I've got this picture of, of some ski, so that the person on the left here is a kind of a beginner and uh, they've just got the hang of a snowplow, which is a quite a, a beginner technique and it's quite stable and, and slow. And the person on the right is a, a you know experienced skier who's using a different technique, going much faster and uh, they can tackle much, much bigger slopes. So learning test driven development, it's like you, you already know how to code. You can get down the slope, you, you can do the thing. And I'm suddenly telling you, oh, you need to do it differently. You need to write the test first. And it's like me standing at the bottom of the slope when you when you know how to snowplow and saying, oh, put your skis together. You need to go faster. Do the, do the parallel turns, bend your knees. And it, that's not what you need to learn a new style of ski. Um, you're clearly going to fall over in a heap and then blame me. And that's largely what happened. So. Uh, Test driven development and refactoring, if, if they don't already know it, you can't just tell them to start. 
So my next attempt to get people to, to do this was coding dojos. So in, in uh, 2005, I met some very uh, thoughtful programmers who had invented this, this way of, of creating a space where you, you practice code carters, which are like exercises where you can do the moves of test driven development and learn about refactoring and writing tests. So you create this safe space with um, support and, and friendly people and you learn together. And this was much more effective at uh, getting people to, to learn these skills. But the, the trouble with the, the coding dojo is that you, you make some progress on these kind of beginner exercises and then you go back to your ordinary legacy code or production system and it's, it's so much harder. There's this gap. So the code cart is like a beautiful beginner slope that's freshly pasted and the, your, your normal code base is just like there are bumps and there are people in the way and, and it's just so much harder that most people just kind of didn't do it. So that wasn't as effective as I'd liked either. You get some way, but not all the way. So my next, so I, I looked at how people actually do successfully learn test driven development. And I've, I've asked a lot of people who I trust, I've done some surveys, and the top picks are normally practicing on code carters and pairing or pair programming with somebody who knows it. So pair programming, if you're doing some of that, is one of the most effective ways to uh, transfer knowledge and skills in the code, skills with the code manipulating it, refactoring it, writing tests. And most of those other things that we had, um, I didn't find anyone who learned code, code, uh, learned TDD from things like code reviews um, or hackathons or training courses. I mean, training courses are great for learning some things, but TDD is not one of those things. So. I mean, these things are great if you're doing them. I don't want to tell you to stop. I'm just saying you probably shouldn't expect them to teach people test-driven development. So preparing is, is something that will. If you've got people in the organisation who know it, that will it will spread. So the next thing that I started doing after uh, coding dojos was technical coaching. Um, and this is uh, a team that I coached together with Llewellyn Falco. Um, in, in 2018, and I saw how effective this was. So you see they're all sitting around the same screen. They're all working together on the same computer. And they are, um, so it's like pair programming, only with more people and with a coach. So that's one part of what technical coaching is. So I came back from that experience with Llewellyn and tried it out in, all my customers basically and then in 2021 I published this book technical agile coaching with the Saman method and this is what I how I work this is a concrete practical method for doing coaching and the word Saman it means together in Swedish I wanted my method to have a name so that you could search for it on the internet it's yeah I just made it up but that's uh, you don't have to read my book if you it's meant for coaches uh, who would like to use this method and I found it's much more successful than anything else I tried, at least. And I ask people at the end what, what outcomes they've seen, and they talk about um, increased collaboration and teamwork, more likely to write unit tests, commit code more often, and more likely to refactor. So this is um, encouraging uh, because I think um, there are so many organisations where developers just don't refactor and they don't write unit tests. And this seems to be a way that actually helps to, uh, to make a difference. And it's all about spreading this culture of, of taking pride and, and doing things in the right way to remove technical debt. And that having the skill and the techniques to be able to do that safely. So the, the Saman method, as I've named it, has two main parts, the learning hour and the ensemble working. So I'm going to explain what I mean by those things. The, the learning hour is where the coach is introducing some of these new techniques, these new skills that people need to learn in order to handle legacy code. 
and we practice on code carters. These kinds of exercises, like the Gilded Rose exercise I showed you at the start, which and these exercises are designed to help you in a small controlled environment to, to use some of these skills and, and learn about them. So this is actually very much like a coding dojo, only with an instructor. The coding dojo is kind of peer sourced learning, and this is much more as a coach I'm teaching. And we do these small, short, only an hour, and we do them relatively often, um, as often as the team thinks they can handle uh, this kind of training. Then we have the uh, the ensemble working. Oh, there was a Why? question, I think. Why? Not sure if that's a question. OK, we'll come back if that's needed. So the ensemble working is the other part of the coaching method, and this is to address that gap that you get between the the, the difficulty of the exercise, which is, you know, it's quite straightforward, it's an exercise, and the difficulty you get in your real production code. Uh, that is a much more difficult situation. So the coach gets together with the development team and you sit down um, and try and work on a realistic task, something either from their backlog or, or some part of the code that they want to try and refactor or improve. And then the, the coach is with the team, helping them to use the techniques in a real situation. And the focus is on practicing these techniques uh, rather than finishing the task. Uh, so it's a time box session, usually two hours. The whole team gets together with the coach and you do this. Um, and hopefully the team learns how to bridge that gap. They can do it in the exercise and they get how to do it in the real code. And these, what I coach depends a lot on the needs of the actual team. Um, a lot of uh, teams need better unit tests. They need to work more incrementally, smaller steps. They need uh, to learn how to refactor safely without introducing bugs. They need help with continuous integration and, and basically raising the skill of the whole team and not having these um, individuals who, are, who know everything and are indispensable, uh, helping to spread that knowledge to everyone in the team. So I'd done this uh, coaching in person and also remotely. So I just wanted to show that I, Today, I do all my coaching remotely, actually, and it works, uh, I think, very well. So it doesn't have to be in person. OK, so then the question is, well, are you th thinking here? Well, I've got a developer who could do that. They know TDD. They, they might be a good a good coach. Um, so that was the next discussion topic. Um, do you have co people in your organization who would like to do this kind of work? And how could you support them? Hey, welcome back. I think uh, that was probably too little time for that discussion, uh, but I, you've written some great points on notes here anyway. And I, I'm partly just trying to spark a discussion really in your organization. But you're making some really interesting points here about, well, we've got both contractors and permanent people and and uh, some of the indispensable people, you know, they couldn't fit this onto their their schedule to do coaching as well as all the being indispensable. And and some developers, of course, don't have the kind of uh, the people skills that you need to do coaching. So uh, yeah, these are all good points. So for for many organisations, they do have people who could grow into these roles. Um, but there's also an option of, of trying to hire for it as well. So I just wanted to point out if you want to hire a technical coach, um, try and look for somebody with experience of the Sandman method. I mean, I would say that, wouldn't I? Uh, but I think it's I think it works. But look for people who have these people skills as well as you know, TDT. Uh, that's um, important in a coach. And if you if you've got your own people, uh, that's what you're looking for, that they they're good at coding and they've got this interest in uh, facilitation and working with people. So growing technical coaches, I think you mentioned you maybe already had a coding dojo. That's a great format for peer-to-peer for -peer learning. And some of the people who've been going to that for a while might be good candidates. 
Um, you can get training. Um, you can bring in a trainer for ensemble. That's the technique where you've got the whole team coding at the same computer and sharing skills. Um, if you if you can hire an external coach and the people who are on that team being coached, they would be perhaps good candidates to uh, to become coaches later. And then pair coaching. That's something I do a lot when I'm working. I usually have a pair. And pairing with an experienced coach is a great way to get good at it yourself. So I kind of feel that the world needs more uh, coaches and I'm doing what I can. You know, I wrote this book uh, to help aspiring coaches to explain how I do it. I've got this website that um, I originally created to just um, complement the book, but it's it's kind of grown into a, a world of its own. Um, so the website now is owned by the Saman Technical Coaching Society, which is a, a not-for-profit organization that I founded. Um, it's real, it, it has a bank account um, and several members, and we look after the website and we host events. Um, the um, events that we usually have every month is, is free to attend and uh, aspiring coaches can come and meet other coaches and get advice. So uh, that's my pitch for if you if you have people in your organization, point them in the direction of the Saman Technical so Technical Coaching Society and they can get some support. So then I think there's probably not enough time left really for much of a discussion, but I did have another uh, slot for you to talk about what you think of all this and what you might do next. So I think you've got, have we got five minutes for that, do you think, Amanda? Yeah, absolutely. Great. That was quick. Yeah, it was, <laughs> that was another quite short discussion. So I just wanted to say thank you for all of your your ideas. I'm, I'm really pleased you're engaging with what I've said and you've thought about it and tried to apply it for your situation. And all of these ideas that you've come up with sound to me like a, um, this could work. It'd be worth doing lots of these things. So please have my encouraging encouragement to try this stuff um, and if you uh, are interested to you do put, point people in the direction of the Saman Society and the exercises that I've got on my GitHub page there, there's another frame on the Myra board with some links um, and yeah thank you very much for having me <laughs>